little bit this time, and we're going to talk about biomechanics. And Lisa's going to give us a talk at the end, understanding biomechanics and fixation at the bone interface. Uh, Izzy and Joe are going to start out by giving a, some case examples of what's going on. And this is something that we're all involved with and we all have seen, regardless of whether you do deformity or degenerative, whatever kind of spine that you do, we are always faced with the possibility of failure of our implants. So with that, I would like to just give uh, Lisa a brief introduction. Lisa was the head of uh, research when she was at uh, Cleveland Clinic of the Department of Neurosurgery and Orthopedics. And then she subsequently went out and started her own company. Lisa is well known around the uh, country as well as the world and is one of the top uh, biomaterials and biomechanical engineers in the country. So we're very, very happy and delighted that Lisa would accept our invitation uh, for this evening and we'll hear from her and you will find her to be an absolute delight if you've never met her before. So Lisa, thank you for coming on and we're gonna start off with Joe and Izzy giving a brief introduction to their cases. Good evening, everybody. Can we get uh, our slides on? There we go. Uh, first off, SSF, thank you for uh, organizing. As always, you guys are doing a great job. And uh, Rick and Jack and uh, Jens and Rod, thank you for spearheading this whole initiative. It's been uh, wonderful over the year. Uh, most of all, Lisa, it's just a pleasure to see you again. I look forward to, to listening to, to your talk with this. Uh, what I'd like to share with you, and I, I can do this in just a couple minutes, is uh, some of the bad ideas that I've encountered in spine surgery. And this really proves why biomechanics really does matter. And over the years, I've collected these cases with the intent of putting together a, a book. Um, now. Heather, this isn't advancing. For, there we go. There we go. So I, you'll see that I uh, organized this essentially in, in chapters, and each chapter has a certain theme to it. But we all know that when we're treating, when we're dealing with spine pathology, the decision is always, always far more important than the incision. And this is work that uh, Lisa may recall from our time at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. And Ed Benzel, our friend and mentor, used to always say kyphosis begets kyphosis. Uh, Mark Kyanja was with us there. And we were doing all this work looking at the biomechanics of kyphosis and the force transmission. And this is really where it all uh, comes from. We have to understand exactly what's happening in the spine. So th this is the bad ideas in spine surgery. This is volume one, chapter one, pushing the envelope. And as you can see here, you've got to read the instructions in, in the context of the situation. So here's a case example that was sent to me to be revised. And it's pretty clear that the biomechanics weren't adhered to early on, uh, necessitating a quite substantial reconstruction to rebuild and get this patient functional again. Here's another one, and, and this was the, the Fernstrom ball revisited. This one was particularly bothersome, and you've got to remember, those who do not study history are really doomed to repeat it. And this was an ultimate setup for failure. So this was a 56-year young male, a work injury, no ridiculous signs, all back and leg pain, and he underwent this Fernstrom ball type device um, through a posterior approach, sacrificing the facets, destroying the biomechanics of the spine, and essentially had to undergo another substantial revision to, to get him back to where he needs to be. Here's another interesting one, and this is the, the new age deformity surgeon, and you can pull up on YouTube and find a video anywhere, and nurse, go on internet.com or surgery.com, scroll down and click, are you totally lost? Well, here was a case that was sent to me, a 78 year young male, uh, served our country in Vietnam, had this degenerative scoliosis and someone decided, and you can see the sagittal and coronal imbalance, and someone decided that a standalone multi-level lateral would be the appropriate treatment for this guy. So he underwent these, these uh, lateral cages and you can see one's not even in the spine, it's sitting in his retroparent neum or in the intradistal space. Uh, the others, he just never corrected the deformity. And unfortunately, this individual was just 
too sick to even continue on, but no accounting for the biomechanics of the spine. And this is another one is when do you say stop? Let me go back to that one. And you see, if it doesn't feel right, smell right, or look right, you know there's got to be something that's wrong. Well, here's a case that was sent to me to be revised. Multiple level vertebral augmentations, multiple level interlaminar devices for stenosis in someone that really had a single level foraminal issue and now has fallen off over the top. So again, not adhering to the basics of biomechanics. And then is there ever too much technology? And, and I kind of like this little cartoon. I'll give you a moment to read it. And this is a 59 year young individual had six previous operations. And I'm not even sure what the surgeons were thinking of when they, when they went through this with all sorts of different technologies that are available, but clearly no adherence to biomechanical principles. And then this is one of my favorites. I call this the, the Mexican kyphoplasty. And it just goes to show you that almost anything can be fixed with duct tape. So here was a, an elderly individual presented with a single level compression fracture, but someone told them that they need the spine fused. So they layered methylmethacrylate from L4 all the way down to the sacrum posteriorly. And again, what is the function of all that? So this was a, a cemented fusion of the spine. And then here, never believe the weatherman. This was also another one of the, the champions of bad ideas in spine surgery. So here's, here's what hurricane forecasters do. They show their predictions and their predictions are all over the place. But here is the cage, and, and these cages, I don't know if anyone's actually seen these, but they were called hurricane cages. That's how they were marketed. And again, the surgeon decided to use this as a standalone, but did an aggressive posterior decompression, destabilizing the facet joints. And three months later, the spine just completely fell apart. And again, necessitated a, a tremendous revision. So what I would maintain is it's not the instrumentation that fails, but it's the surgeon's understanding of biomechanics that fails. And with that, I'm going to introduce Joe Albano, our, our fellow, who's got one of the cases that he and I had to work on that really highlights the issues of understanding the biomechanics. Joe? Thank you, Dr. Lieberman. As he alluded to, I am uh, Joe Albano, one of the uh, spine fellows at the Texas Back Institute. Um, and uh, the case I'm going to be presenting kind of uh, hints at the fact that uh, proximal junctional kyphosis and failure is really more about biomechanics than, than uh, anything else. Um, so this is a 76, a 70 year, year young female that Dr. Lieberman and I treated a few months ago. She presented to the clinic with severe neck pain and the inability to lift up her head. Um, she had previously undergone a thoracal lumbar fusion in January of 2019 and subsequently a 360 multi-level cervical fusion in January of 2020. Uh, none of these surgeries made her better. All of these surgeries made her worse from her preoperative state, uh, and she's been miserable since the time of her first surgery. She presents to us with progressive collapse of the kyphosis, debilitating neck pain. She also has some low back pain uh, and pain radiating into all of the extremities. Um, on exam, she's got a, a noticeable cervical thoracic kyphosis. Her gait is slow and purposeful. She has difficulty getting up and laying down. She has difficulty looking straight ahead. No focal neurologic deficits, no upper motor neuron signs, just diffuse deconditioning weakness just from um, increased energy expenditure. So these are her preoperative images and you can see her long construct, thoracal lumbar fusion construct. Uh, and you can see that she's uh, got a drop head deformity at the cervical thoracic uh, junction. Um, looking uh, at her sagittal parameters, you can see that she's negatively sagittally balanced. Her pelvis is retroverted in an attempt to compensate for her drop head deformity. Looking a little more granularly at the area of interest, uh, you see that she has an 81 degree cervical thoracic kyphosis. Um, the previous surgeons tried to preclude this by cementing the upper three instrumented levels um, and the top two levels, T3 and T4, are, uh, were, were instrumented with sublaminar tethers 
in T5 with a pedicle screw. Uh, you can see that the pedicle screw did hold up, but the sublaminar tethers uh, pulled out. You can see that the, um, the rod is dorsal to the spine uh, itself. And so this is just a CT scan kind of cutting through. Uh, mine's frozen, sorry. Uh, CT scan cutting through. Um, just to look at it a little more closely. And uh, if you stop there, you can see that, uh, again, the spine, the rod is dorsal to the spine. It's uh, the, the sublaminar tethers have clearly failed. Um, and uh, she's pitched forward as a result of this construct. So this was our preoperative plan using our templating robotic software. We had uh, intended on putting pedicle screws all the way up to the uh, previous construct in the cervical spine, revising some of the screws in the, in the proximal aspect of the existing thoracolumbar construct um, and doing several osteotomies. With the alignment software that we use, we were able to calculate uh, where we wanted to do the osteotomies, how much of a correction we would get um, by doing such osteotomies and, and get a rough estimate of where we wanted her to end up postoperatively. So this was her positioned on the table preoperatively. And, and you can see, you know, clinically, she does have radiographic evidence of an 81 degree curve. And you can see her on the table, she has virtually a 90 degree curve um, in this cervical thoracic junction. I mean, you can, it's a significant drop off. Uh, and just here's a couple of views of that, uh, of how bad her deformity is. And you can imagine that she had difficulty looking straight ahead as a result of this. So our plan was to remove some of the hardware from T3 to T6, revise the screws, put pedicle screws up and connect to the rod. We, were, uh, we wanted to do Smith-Peterson osteotomies at multiple levels so that we can get a deformity correction. And if we felt that we did not have enough, we were prepared to do a pedicle subtraction osteotomy in the upper thoracic spine. So again, here are her preoperative registration fluoroscopic images, and you can see the distance between uh, the previous thoracolumbar construct and her cervical, um, cervical fusion as well. And that's what we wanted to link to proximally. So this is our gross dissection photograph taken intraoperatively. And what you can see is these blue instruments here are the um, mechanisms by which the uh, sublaminar tethers attach uh, from the rod to the, uh, to the sub sublaminarly in the spine. Uh, but of note, there are two or three vertebral segments that even looking from the patient's head, which is up here, uh, there are two or three vertebral segments that you cannot see because the, the, um, the drop-off is so significant. And so this is what we did in terms of instrumentation. We put pedicle screws up to uh, T1 and did uh, multiple Smith-Peterson osteotomies and were able to get her uh, nicely corrected. You can see that her cervical plate, which was previously pointing uh, parallel to the floor is now uh, much more vertical. Looking at our intraoperative uh, photographs, uh, this is post-instrumentation. You can see our pedicle screws. Uh, you can see our Smith-Peterson osteotomies. And whereas you could see a significant drop off before from the same position, you can see that she's much better aligned. Uh, and this is us connecting to her uh, uh, cervical fusion. So we were able to get her a considerable amount of correction. Looking at her post-operative standing films where she had an 85 degree, 81 degree curve, excuse me, preoperatively, she's now improved to a, a 48 degree curve. Without looking at any of the sagittal parameters, what you can see is that she's standing straighter and her head is now pointing at the horizon without much strain on the upper cervical segments. Looking at her preoperative and postoperative gross uh, pictures, whereas you saw a significant drop off here after we were able to correct her, we, um, without doing a pedicle subtraction osteotomy and incurring more morbidity as a result, we, she has now a much more rounded and much more balanced um, cervical thoracic uh, area. When you compare her preoperative and postoperative standing parameters, you can see that her pelvis was retroverted preoperatively. Uh, her sagittal balance was overall negative as a result of her having to compensate for her drop head deformity. After our correction, you can see that she's nicely balanced, centered over the hips. Her pelvis is in a more neutral position and her head, whereas it was straining to look down before, is now resting comfortably looking at the horizon. 
So this is an article that um, I pulled uh, it, it, as it relates to this case. And this article was out of uh, uh, the Journal of Neuroscience in 2017. It looked at the effect of uh, posterior polyethylene tethers on the biomechanics of proximal junctional kyphosis. They did a fine element analysis. This was a cadaveric study. And what they found is that basically the more tethers that you use at the proximal aspect of the construct, the less adjacent segment stress that there is, and also the more gradual transition and range of motion that there is at the upper segments and the segments above where the construct ends. On the opposite end of that spectrum, this is a paper that Dr. Lieberman and Dr. Kayanja participated in in 2008 in Spine. And this is saying that this article looked at how, you know, uh, the amount of implant that you use in the proximal segment. In other words, using pedicle screws versus uh, transverse process hooks versus pedicle screws plus a hybrid screw construct in thoracic fixation leads to a more rigid um, fixation point proximally and prevents pullout. Um, it's interesting to me that you have two articles talking about trying to prevent the same problem with completely different biomechanic principles. Uh, and I think that it's important to note that it's more important to have a balanced spine and rely less on your fixation um, than it is, than there is a, a golden goose in terms of uh, the, the correct fixation point at the proximal end of the segment. So Joe, thank you for that. And yeah, that, that case really brought out a lot of the, the issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm really looking forward to, to Lisa's comments on it. Uh, and the two articles are interesting. And one of the things that in the conclusion of that first finite element analysis article, it says the results of this finite element analysis have to be validated with clinical uh, studies. And clearly when it comes to finite element analysis, it's based on a lot of assumptions that we actually program into the analysis. And from a clinical perspective, I really never understood doing more dissection and putting something in to effectively uh, stabilize or, or lessen the transition zone when you are destabilizing it by removing a lot of the ligaments and the interspinous supraspinous to get some of these sublaminar tapes or hooks or other devices above. But having said that, let's move on to Lisa and teach us what it is we need to know about biomechanics of the bone implant interface. God knows, Lisa, we need to learn about it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It's really an honor to be here this evening. And it's so good to see all of your lovely faces. I just, I've, I've worked with all of you for so long now um, that I'm your family <laughs> at this point. I'm going to start with really kind of talking about <clears throat> some basic biomechanics from a real high level, just a few slides, but just looking at uh, Dr. Lieberman and Dr. Albano's talk, I cringed at some of those images and I thought, oh, what were they thinking with respect to the um, original surgeries <clears throat> and the uh, total disregard for biomechanical principles? Let's see if I can get this to advance. No, it's not going through. Oh, there we go. So we'll start with some basic uh, mechanical principles. And I'm going to talk with the, uh, the principles with respect to the tissue environment, as well as the materials and the implants, and introduce some newer technologies that try to incorporate these, um, excuse me, incorporate into the implant design ways that you can enhance that fixation healing at the interface to really improve upon the biomechanical uh, relationship between the bone and the implant and to provide evidence that actually shows why biomechanics really does matter. Here we go. <clears throat> so why is it important to think about improving that interface mechanics between the implant and the tissue? Because there's a balance between the time to heal and the time to achieve stabilization. If you can improve the mechanics of that interface, then you can decrease that healing time. If you decrease the healing time, then you obviously decrease the failure risk. 
I had put together this biomechanical fusion cascade a while back when I thought about earlier bone interface fixation. If you can grab onto that implant um, early on through osseointegration, through bone apposition with different structures, et cetera, you can actually get earlier stabilization because through that early osseointegration, you can reduce the micromotion uh, after um, immediate implantation until you start to get some fixation and, and bone apposition and interdigitation within the implant. Once you start to get that osseointegration and interdigitation, you can reduce micromotion and you can increase that stability on the outside where then you can start to incorporate more bone recruit and alternatively achieve a faster fusion. But there's multiple factors that can influence that fixation at the interface and influence the eventual spinal stabilization. And there's many, many more than what I've listed here, but in general, tonight we'll talk about just different designs of implants and surface geometries and textures to get better apposition, better gripping, better osseointegrative properties at the interface, different materials, and also the anatomy and the tissue integrity. So we'll start with some basic mechanics of the tissue and the biomaterials. Uh, <clears throat> biomaterials, materials in general, and human tissue have a property called viscoelasticity. I know you're all familiar with this. It's a, a mechanical term that relates to an object that can behave both like a fluid and a solid, and it can behave in a nonlinear fashion. Both bone and soft tissue are viscoelastic. They have different extents of visco viscoelasticity, but they both behave in this manner. One thing to also think about when I look at the pictures that um, Dr. Lieberman and Dr. Albano had, had shown us, with some of them, it's almost as if the folks are thinking that bone is a rigid body. It is a dynamically changing material. Soft tissue is as well. It adapts. Again, it behaves like a fluid and a solid. With the properties of viscoelasticity, you can have relaxation under stress of all tissue, but it's also strain rate dependent. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you pull or load a tissue fast, you'll get a very stiff response. If you pull it or load it slowly, you can get very large displacements and a much um, slower response and you may not damage it right away if it's a lower stiffness. I use the example of silly putty. It's a nonlinear material where if you pull it fast, it'll snap, if you all remember that, um, being a kid. And if you pull this slowly, you get a long, large displacement as if you were pulling on chewing gum. Sorry, there we go. So I wanna to touch base on load balance and really how load is distributed throughout the anterior and the posterior columns of the spine. There's an alignment along what we call the neutral axis. This is that axis that <clears throat> is really at the center between the anterior and posterior or ventral and dorsal margin of the, the spine. It runs along that uh, middle portion, as you see here in the stipple region of the spine where as you rotate about this, you don't have a bending moment. This is this axis absorbs all of the load, axial loads at this region. As you migrate beyond that in order to achieve a flexion moment or an extension bending moment, you, have, you can decrease the force where as you come out, you can induce injury at a much lower force. So it's along this neutral axis where you have the greatest force absorption or force uh, bearing margin of the spine. But when we think about how that force is distributed through the anterior and the posterior column in the healthy spine or the healthy motion segment as shown here in this diagram, the vertebra and the disc will actually take up 55 to 60% of that axial load. The cortical shell does play a role. It'll absorb about 10%. The posterior ligaments will absorb about 10 to 
the, what they do is they pull the force away from the disc and from the bone 10 to 15% and transmit it elsewhere. The facets will actually absorb 20 to 25% in the healthy spine. You get a uniform distribution of this load that transmits to the annulus, producing a uniform tension across that annulus. <clears throat> and the, link, the ligaments actually function as pulleys, as I said before, where they'll actually pull that stress away from the disc. However, in the degenerative motion segment, things start to break down. You start to eccentrically load your disc and your spine. <clears throat> and now your vertebra and disc can only absorb or make load bear about 40% of that axial load. So what happens is the stress or the load has to go elsewhere. Well, where does it go? It basically goes to your facets as shown here where your facet joint now is taking up 40%, double the load that it could absorb in the healthy spine because the vertebra and the disc can no longer maintain that healthy 60% uh, of that load. And you also end up getting an anisotropic stress profile. When you address this through some sort of fusion device or anterior ventral support, such as um, an interbody fusion system, you shift your center of rotation. But more importantly, now your vertebra re and your disc region that's holding the graft actually absorbs or load bears more load up to 70%. Again, the cortical shell is 10%. Um, and the facets are offloaded, but now they're offloaded quite a bit to 10 to 15%. So again, you've alleviated that, that um, load bearing to the facet problem, but now you've changed your load profile again so that that disc space is now functioning more as a rigid structure. With respect to biomaterials, they also play a role with respect to how the stabilization will respond. Um, and this is just a, a general table. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but it can show you the differences you can have between metals, polymers, and ceramic materials. And so many of our implants are a mixture of these materials where you can have very different strength and fatigue durability um, properties. You can have very different wear properties. Polymers wear differently from metals. There's um, many degradation, degradation and corrosion differences. But more importantly, you have different tissue reactions and biological responses to these materials as well. So let's get into some newer technologies that have been used to address some of these biomechanical challenges. And again, I'll touch on a few of them, but there's many more. There's um, open architectures that have come into play greater surface area of contact at the bone interface through larger bone communicating areas with this open architecture um, and larger footprints where you can actually reduce the stress that's transferred to the vertebral end plate or the bone interface, for instance. You can distribute that stress and strain to the implant through different modulus, um, pro moduli properties of the um, material of the implant or the composite materials of the implant. You can change the shape of the implant and you can change the surface texture for enhanced bone apposition and even mechanotransduction. We'll start with open architecture. With the advent of 3D printing, you could now develop, and I'll get into it in a couple more slides, open architectures that allowed for more area of bone incorporation, a larger area for bone graft, a bigger footprint that gives you greater area to distribute the stress over, and um, multi-planar uh, entry points for bone exchange for a larger, better fusion graft. As additive manufacturing came about in medical devices, it's been around for many, many, many years in aerospace industry, we found that we could create these complex open matrices that can't be machined, that they have to be additively manufactured or 3D printed. We can create graded structures. We can create repetitive microstructures that are not only lightweight components, but they significantly increase that surface area for increased efficiency, fluid exchange, thermal exchange, bone exchange. There's many advantages to it. You can image through some of these implants. And again, think about the design. You can't image through all of them, 
Um, and, and just because you can print it in titanium doesn't mean it'll be strong enough. There's a lot of things that can go wrong as much as there's a lot of things that make it right and, and provide these advantages. You can um, create rough surfaces that can induce mechanotransduction, transduction, increase the friction, which has been shown to reduce device migration because it does increase that coefficient of friction. You can allow for bone ingrowth through multiple points of entry as discussed. And then you can also customize the fit to a patient's anatomy. Um, we talk about this effective modulus. So you'll hear folks say, listen, titanium, that, it has a very high modulus. Well, that's true as a bulk material. But when you start to design it with open structures, large pores, you can change the mechanics. So the modulus of a printed open architecture cage is not made out of titanium is not the same as what we call the bulk modulus of the titanium, i.e. a cube of solid titanium. A cube of solid titanium is going to be very, very, very stiff. However, with these open designs, you can actually create it so that that modulus is equivalent or even less than that of bone. Another concept to think about is end plate conformity. If you can have that implant, and I'm using interbody as the best example because we're talking about not only the vertebral end plate, which is a viscoelastic adaptive structure, but also the implants. Over the years, we've tested thousands of interbody cages, and every single one of them have very different, unique designs, but Few of them actually lack the ability to have any kind of conformity to the end plates. There's always a little bit of curvature, but a lot of them are just flat. And I thought you've got these sharp rectangular edges that are gonna bite into that end plate. I never quite understood that because when you can conform to that end plate, you've, you basically offload the stress um, and reduce that stress, excuse me, reduce the stress going to the vertebral end plate and reduce and lower the risk to subsidence occurring as shown here. And one of the implants we had done, there's a study I'm gonna uh, get into in the next slide is, we showed where this, this is a spinology cage where we filled the inner mesh and it allows for bone to grow into um, and other things to leave uh, the graph containment area. But what you're seeing here is um, taking a comparison where we did monolithic cages of the same size as the composite cage, which was um, a mesh surrounding bone graft material and peak end and terminal ends. And we loaded them in both curved and straight plates. And what we found is this graft region at lower loads and higher loads not only loads that bone graft directly, and that's what you're seeing here, but it also loads deep inside the end plate, uh, the uh, bone graft region as well. Whereas the monolithic cages with the large open pores are not loading that at all. What happens is the viscoelasticity of that curved end plate will take a few weeks where it has to actually settle and conform around the implant. But at that point where it's a straight end plate um, on the implant, you basically are flattening out your vertebral end plate and losing that curvature of the end plate. And finally, we get into surface technologies. We can change the textures and the geometries of the surfaces, and we can do things like induce mechanotransduction, which is inducing cellular responses um, to these mechanical stimuli, and they convert those responses to chemical, um, electrical um, uh, reactions. And then they tell their other cellular friends and they can form very efficient cellular uh, matrices and uh, adapt and, and evolve into tissue matrices. The surfaces also increase the coefficient of friction, which helps reduce the risk of migration as well as the cell structure, uh, cells like the rougher surfaces for better opposition. So, Prior to printing, there was a lot of etched porous and rough surfaces, and even now um, they're developing these surface structures that are porous on the top, especially in peak shown here. This is the Viterra or invasive device. And um, what they're getting is they're seeing better bone apposition, osseointegration, and growth interdigitation to the surface. 
Um, there's also technologies where um, these are faceted screws and they're micro facets placed on each thread and on the inside um, of the roots where it's a very unique surface geometry. And these are machined, not printed where you can have multiple facets and you can actually optimize the bone volume of capture and optimize that viscoelastic relaxation of bone. So what happens is this screw, because of the facets, creates a cumulative effect where it can go in at a very low insertional torque. We did a, um, a significant series of tests on this design of these screws and you're getting 50, 40 to 50 percent less of an insertional torque than a conventional helical screw. Why is that important? Well, if you can go in at a lower torque without inducing micro fractures of dense bone, because some of these torques can be so high that you're actually damaging that bone interface at a micro level. Um, you can also um, avoid fragmentation displacements with these, this faceted screw because you're going in at a much lower torque. And finally, what we found, which I think this was the most fascinating piece, was that you're going in at the same applied torque you're getting twice the compression um, across a fracture site, for example, of that bone where with the helical conventional screw, you're closer to basically stripping the screw before you can reach that compressive force across a fracture site. And again, this, um, more importantly, what we found with the faceted screw was, even though we had a low insertional torque of 50% less than a conventional screw, um, you can basically get 15 to 50%, we even saw as high as 60% greater pullout resistance of that screw. Very important with respect to thinking about pedicle screws in compromised patients. And we also found that we saw earlier bone growth into the screw, and I'm going to show you the next um, set of pictures where uh, this is really where you see biomechanical concepts coming to fruition. Um, there was a cheap study that we conducted where we um, placed the screw into um, numerous sheep. After 28 days, they were, uh, we put them across the vertebral body because we wanted to see how this screw responded in cancellous bone. Uh, we harvested the vertebra and we did a pullout test on these and histology as well. Um, and what you're finding here is that the facet screw, the faceted screw, excuse me, um, showed increased osteogenesis and bone apposition here, up to 76 to 100% bone apposition inside those threads. It goes all the way into the root of each thread as opposed to the conventional where we got, and this is a typo, it's 50 to 75% bone apposition. And as you can see, you get some that go all the way into the root, but this is after um, 28 days and you're still looking at um, spaces that exist in fibrous tissue deep within the, the root of that thread. But this one was my favorite. <laughs> because I dissected every single one of these. And this is not a, just a representative photo. This was found in all of the um, screws that I had dissected. What's interesting is in the faceted screw, this is cortical bone. We did a bicortical and unicortical study as well. I was removing the, the um, dissected specimens so that we could look at um, the, the specimens prior to pull out. And what we found was you're getting tissue ingrowth from both sides of the cortices of this uh, femoral specimen, uh, excuse me, it was a tibial specimen here. And you're getting bone growth and relaxation on these facets as shown here, all the way across and significant growth on the edges. Whereas the conventional screw you're starting to see it. This is the same exact time point. You're starting to see it on the edges, but it really hasn't come into play here at all. So when you start to think about these new technologies, it's starting to take us through a new era of evaluation, really trying to understand what's happening at that bone implant or even soft tissue implant interface with respect to earlier stability, what kind of implant designs do we incorporate to achieve that? 
we also need to think about evaluating the macro, micro, and nano mechanics to really better understand the tissue matrix and the, at the cellular and molecular level as well. Think about things like uh, mechanotransduction. And knowing this, it can lead us to actually designing implants where we can guide cell growth and form better, more efficient tissue matrices. So we talk about evaluating the new era implants, what I'm calling uh, micro and nano mechanics. When you think about an implant, and I'm using this um, interbody cage as an example, you think about the macro load we apply from the spine, i.e. the axial load from walking, for instance. We're applying that along the, cord, the, the spine, but looking at it, applying it as a whole to the implant itself, we look at the macro mechanics. What's the overall stiffness? What's the overall modulus of this implant? But what we do know from other work we've done with this is that the stress will transfer down these trusses and you're getting a different potentially anisotropic distribution of that stress in each of these struts that make up a truss structure. And with that said, now we need to think about the micromechanics and the micro strain that's occurring along these struts to better understand how force and stress is distributed even throughout bone and bone healing. And then we can even take it to the nano level where we can change the surface roughness, the surface geometry, where we can um, do that and change the surface charges, which will attract different types of molecules. We can increase the mechanotransduction or decrease it, obviously. And we can change the coefficient of friction. Thinking about all of that in the future, now we can really start to think about making and creating controlled structures that can guide cellular growth, that can actually uh, determine what tissue will grow. We can create bioactive surfaces, provide specific physical cues to guide that growth, differentiate that cells, cellular growth, and create efficient matrices with specific functions um, to this. This is a MEMS structure. It's a five-layer PDMS printed porous structure with, um, uh, it's a microstructure with micro posts and micro texture and nano surfaces. And this was done uh, early work from the Cleveland Clinic. And what they did was um, they could actually control cellular growth and form a tissue matrix, matrix excuse me, matrix, which could um, grow four levels deep into this structure. And it was all basically controlled in response to um, this mechanotransduction of the microtextures and microposts that have um, the response of the cells to these structures. So in summary, it's really looking at that whole picture to really understand not only the biomechanics, but the environment you're putting this into. Again, what is the biomechanics, the biology, the integrity of that tissue? What's happening at the interface? Really understanding the biomechanics, again, of the bone or the soft tissue, as well as the implant, and how will they react together, um, the materials of that implant, the structure of that implant, the design factors that go into that. It's not this or this, it's looking at this as a cumulative effect to really understand what's happening with respect to the stabilization in that region. So in essence, biomechanics really does matter, but we do have to be careful when we talk about new technologies. We tend to um, overuse it because it's the latest, greatest, sexiest technology out there. As we continue to innovate, we can improve outcomes, quality of life and longevity, but we do have to really be cognizant of the fact that as we continue to progress, there's many great advantages to that, but there's also a lot of disadvantages. So we really have to be careful that we don't use the technology in areas where we're either overusing it or using it incorrectly because we didn't have a complete understanding um, not only of the biomechanics, but of the um, environment that we're placing these implants into. Thank you for your time.
Lisa, that was terrific. Uh, Lisa, there's a, a couple questions uh, that were in the chat room, and then I have some questions. I'm sure that Izzy and other folks do too. But uh, let's go to the chat room. One of the questions was, uh, can, it was a question about tapping for pedicle screws. Is that a good or bad thing? Should we not be doing that? I think I always learned that uh, some folks will just tap the cortex. Um, I think if you tap all the way down, Obviously, you don't want to tap can cancellous bone because it's already a porous structure. But I think if you just, if you can tap the cortex, which is very thin on the pedicles, you've got a better shot of when you go into that region, provided you don't over tap the entire pedicle, you won't risk microfracture of that cortical shell upon entry. And I don't know if you've seen that surgically, if you're not tapping um, and maybe just by pre-drilling, slightly pre-drilling that pilot hole, you can achieve the same thing and minimize any risk of microfracture. But I'd always learned just to go all the way down and tap is probably not the best idea because your, your two thirds of it are within the vertebral body. And Lisa, you know, I was fascinated with the, the work you're showing on the faceted screws. So how come every manufacturer doesn't do it? Is that something patented that only a certain company has? Yes, it is. And it's funny because, and I have no financial interest in it. I just loved this screw because they came to us in small group. A roofer invented this technology. A roofer. A roofer. <laughs> He made, he couldn't get the shingles to stay in and he came up with this faceted idea to, and he's from Philadelphia, believe it or not. And I- All right, well, he must be smart then. <laughs> and um, he had this idea to make faceted screws to keep the shingles adhered. So um, a medical device uh, engineer had uh, met him somehow and took on this technology. And I remember him coming to us and and the first test we did was what we call a relaxation test. He said, no, 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 put the screw in, pull it on day zero, pull it 24 hours later, pull it 72 hours later. So um, we did. And um, it, goes, it, it goes in half inspirational talk and you're thinking, hmm, because you do everything by feel, right? You think, no, this doesn't feel right. But the problem I have with the this doesn't feel right. I need to I need to feel it and hear it squeak. Is when you hear it squeak, you've already damaged the bone, the tulipet of the pedicle screw. You don't want to do that. You're taking the material, whatever it is, beyond its elastic zone. You've entered that deformation phase. So we put the screws in and we pull it out the first day, and it was significantly higher. So we're like, okay. So we wait 72 days, has 72 hours. We go in, and I just check the torque. Uh, again, and it was early on a Sunday morning. I thought, okay, this is reading barely any torque. Thinking this is going to be a doozy. When we pull out, it'll be nothing. It was four times stronger. That's when I went, hmm, this is interesting. So uh, it, it was a concept where you think you're going in, and instead of having just a constant torque as you're inserting that screw, it's almost like a cumulative cutting effect. So each time that facet turns, it cuts a little bit, but it cuts in a way where it's cumulative and it's less offensive to the material interface. And, and you're really getting that pull out, but it's a counterintuitive to surgeons because you're used to doing everything by feeling it and you can't feel this. And, and, and part of that problem is like I said, you don't wanna take things to where you can hear it squeak you're just at the max of the torque because that's where you're starting to enter that deformation phase of the material. So Lisa, in, you said in 72 hours, it was four times greater the, the pullout torque. Or, so how do you rationalize that? Certainly the cells haven't grown into the, the threads. It was just, it's just a mechanical is well, fixation or I, I don't understand that. I started to think about this because at first I'm going, how can this, it wasn't even in bone at that time. Now we've done multiple studies in, in bone as well with this later on and in the sheep study, but this is long before. Thinking, how can this be? 
it was saw bones. Well, you can still get relaxation of that material. And what's happening is, and I had theorized this before, that's why that cortical bone segment that I was showing you where you saw the bone growing across the facet, faceted screws faster really came into play with respect to the bone mechanics. As that, that substrate, and it's hard to believe when you're thinking saw bones, it just relaxed somewhat, just like any material will creep or relax, um, regardless of what it is, we do it all the time with implants. Um, I think the saw bones had started to do that because we're thinking this just doesn't make sense. Well, over time with numerous studies after that, um, we found that that became true because it was constantly repeated where we'd see the same effect and we'd, we'd see it in human bone that we ran. We saw it in the animal study and then we saw it in the dissections of the animals that I had showed you. So Lisa, are these screws commercially available? That was one of the other questions from the chat room. Yes, they are. Are They're, you allowed to say what company it is? Or? I, allowed, I, I think so. Am I allowed to? <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, we're not advertising for them. I'm just curious because so many questions are they commercially available and, you know, I've never heard of them before. Oh, before. they are. They're, um, it's under a company called Diamond Orthopedics. Interesting. So they have the patent and nobody else can copy it. Yes. And they do the machining. I mean, that's that whole patented uh, process, I think, is is the significant part. Um, and they, they're actually machining quite a bit for different folks in okay. applications, different areas. Do any of the panelists have questions? I don't want to hog it up. Izzy, do you have a question or anybody else? Yeah, in turn, uh, Lisa, great, uh, great information as always. And every time I listen to you, I, I learn something new, which is, uh, which is wonderful. It's great. And it's such a uh, kind. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you, you mentioned the 3D printing and the endless possibilities of it. Where, where do you see us, meaning spine, going with respect to uh, patient-specific implants and 3D printing and how to match up biomechanics? I'm going to say something, and you probably won't like this. Um, well, I'll say two things. One, what I try to get across is, because when printing first came out, everybody kind of went crazy, and, and that was all the rage. The problem is the 3D printing is just a tool. It is a tool to make these structures. Um, it's not how you, because we'll see a lot of folks try to mark it as, oh, it's 3D printed, which doesn't mean anything, in all honesty. Um, because if you don't design it right, it could fail miserably. But the part that worries me is, again, we see that with a lot of new technologies. Everybody kind of adapts and thinks it's the, the next greatest thing. And it can be, but you have to be realistic about the things that can go wrong as well. And so I worry about being able to print in the office because a lot of engineering, a lot of understanding of the biomechanics go into these implant designs. That's why, you know, I've spent a decade now testing implants and really starting to assess different designs and things that can go wrong and can be catastrophic. And you go, ooh, bad idea or interesting design or, hmm, they're onto something. So really understanding those nuances and understanding the environment of biomechanics is, is um, crucial to being able to print devices because so many things can go wrong. That's the part that worries me. Printing in an in, in office and, and making tweaks to the design or that printed design could be catastrophic for a patient unless you understand the biomechanics and the environment you're putting them into. And the things that can go wrong, not only with that the biomechanical part, but the implant and the material itself and the printing. Again, printing processes, that build process, that's all validated. It's not like you can just print and, and hey, this is gonna work. We, we spend endless hours and countless money on working with the manufacturers to making sure that printing process and that build process is correct and safe. So Lisa, you know, this was great, but 
you know, one, one of my pet peeves, we're able to correct these deformities and Izzy showed an unbelievable case, but now we're doing these in elderly people whose biomechanics of their spine stinks. They're osteoporotic, mm -hmm. 